We're going to continue talking about the gas giants today. I'm going to call them gas giants because it's going to be confusing if I don't call them that. They're not gas, though, so this is kind of a strange holdover. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other ridiculous things like that that we still use the phrases for in science that don't really apply. Anyways, uh, we call them gas giants, but really they're very liquidous. Um, I, I would call them liquid giants, and, and maybe if we have time we'll get into the ice giants, which are a special kind. Um, they have heavier molecules than, and heavier elements even than the gas giants. Uh, the reason that these things are so, so interesting and exciting, uh, hopefully I started to impress upon you guys last, last class, was that in my mind, uh, looking at the future of planetary sciences, and astrophysics in general, and this will start to make a lot more sense when we talk about stars and the life and death of stars, for lack of a better word. Um, they're not technically alive, hint, uh, you know, <laughs> spoiler alert. But they do have this evolutionary progression, right, <clears throat> in, their own, uh, in their own sphere. And I think, that, I think that starting to think about these planetary bodies in terms of evolution is a really revolutionary idea that I want you guys to, to embrace a little bit. And... Um, you know, this isn't something that's going to pop up in your textbook at all, but it's really fascinating if you think, um, how many of you guys have taken any biology classes ever? Okay, right on. You all have been through high school, basically. So you know about the idea of evolution and natural selection more or less as something of standard dogma in, let's say, biological sciences today. Um, but that's a relatively recent conception, actually, which is kind of fascinating. So, you know... Uh, Darwin and this guy Wallace basically came up with this idea at the same moment, which is really interesting. And we see this all the time, which is also really fascinating. You know, calculus was invented by two people at almost the exact same moment in history. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, relativity was also invented by two, you know, Einstein. There's usually one person who, who takes the spotlight, but there's always more than one person who's working on it. And, and a really interesting thing with evolution and bear with me, because this is going to tie back to astrophysics and astronomy in a second. So Darwin and Wallace were working on this same theory uh, of evolution. And when Darwin found out that Wallace basically had, had come, along, come up with the same idea, he was writing this, Darwin was writing this huge book uh, with all the details of everything he could think about regarding his, his ideas that he'd come up with. And... Uh, he found out that Wallace was about to publish his book, and so Darwin chopped his book down to a short abstract and published that ahead of Wallace, uh, which became known as The Origin of Species. That's the very famous Darwin book that you all are aware of, or that you probably heard about in, in biology class or something. So there's something really interesting there, and, and I don't think that... Uh, I, think that, I think that there's something really interesting there about how ideas... Like, where does an idea come from? That's a really interesting question, right? You might say, I had an idea, but did you have the idea, or was the idea sort of there and you saw it? Like, was the world ready? Did all of the information happen to converge at that moment so that you could see what was, what was necessary? I mean, that case can be made in each one of these instances, like with, with Newton and calculus, um, on the other side of, of the, the channel, there was Leibniz, who also came up with the same thing. And the same thing happens with relativity. Lorentz also had a relativistic uh, conception of relativity. Uh, but the question is, why did they have it at the same time? And uh, I think that's really something interesting. And I think, I think we're going to see the same sort of changes happen in astrophysics as well. It's just that at some point, the old theories stop being able to account for the data as it, as, as it amasses. And the data that we're getting right now about planetary science and about pl planet formation is just piling up almost faster than we can analyze it. But it, 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 in some sense, it, it sort of belies the narratives that, that you'll find published in the textbook to some extent, which are these very clean-cut, orderly stories of you know, planets being formed in this disk and they live their lives and they're eaten by the sun eventually. This is the very neat conservative story that we've, we've got and the, the one that you'll find in your textbook for the most part. Um, but I think that, that actually that science is trending towards something more like evolutionary theory, something more like natural selection. 
Um, and why shouldn't it, after all? I mean, it's a, it's a very reasonable idea. I mean, I, I wrote these down, the, the tenets of natural selection. Variation exists within populations with respect to morphology, so shape, physiology, so internal structure, and behavior, right? Well, that's the first tenet that's accepted as sort of a preliminary first principle. Well, that seems to be the case with planetary bodies as well. Let's say celestial bodies, stars, and so forth as well. There's a lot of variation, right? There's different layering structures you can compare and contrast them to one another. Um, the second tenet, different traits confer different rates of survival and reproduction. Well, that's kind of interesting too. I mean, you can kind of think of an analog in planetary sciences too. If a planet happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, let's say at the wrong region with respect to the star, it's going to change whether it can make it or not. And we're going to see a really interesting example of that today when we're, we're going to talk about this, val this strange valley uh, between Neptunes and Earths, right, where there's, uh, there doesn't seem to be any planets that are able to occupy this, this size region, let's say. And why is that? And, uh, you know, spoiler alert again, it, it comes down to the fact that those, are those create unstable orbit orbits that tend to collide with one another. So the thought is that those planets get sort of weeded out, which is an, it's an, it's an interesting analog of natural selection in that sense. Um, and then the final idea is that traits can be passed from generation to generation. Okay, so that might seem like, well, obviously, like, these planets aren't reproducing and stuff. But uh, I don't know. If you take a closer look at that, it's not quite, it's not quite so clear. I mean, we, we're not talking about stars in this, uh, per se in this course, and we'll do it all next semester with the luxury of detail. But look, our star has elements inside of it and our solar system that had to have come from previous generations of stars. Some of these really heavy, heavy elements like uranium, for instance, even big, even big things beyond iron, which is like half the periodic table, they had to have come from bigger stars than our star. So our star is at least a second, maybe third, maybe fourth, I don't know how many generations, nobody really knows how many generations of stars went into our star, right? So in some sense, there is this sort of seed from previous generations that's carried on in the planets and in the stars that we're looking at in, in our moment today. So there is this generative thing. There's also the idea that collisions happen, right? That, that, that uh, hybrids happen, right? Where do we talk about the story of our moon that's become popular in the last decade where there's this Theia collision, right? And certainly that was actually the melting of two different bodies with one another, right? There's something very generative about that that has like parallels in biology as far as I can tell. So I think that we really are moving towards a more evolutionary paradigm in planetary sciences. And like I said, you're not going to find that written in a textbook or anything like that. It's, uh, it's, um, I can't claim it to be like an original idea that I've had, but it's very fringe right, right now. And that's how ideas start off is that there's sort of murmurings of these ideas before somebody actually makes it. Uh, makes a presentation that the wider scientific community can get behind. Now, now, now not, natural selection was not popular, by the way, when it first came out. In fact, people hated it. They were, they were in the streets about it. They were upset because natural selection sort of took out the concept of progress from, from heredity. So there was this I very long-held idea that there was... A tele Do you guys know what the word teleology means? Anybody? Yeah, you've heard it a little bit. The Greeks love this word, but it's sort of this, this idea of there is an ideal endpoint, and everything, say in a story or in a philosophy or in a meta narrative, everything progresses towards some end, right? You know, you experience this in your own lives, right? You start off as sort of an infant who can, can't feed itself. And then by the time that you're fully grown, you're actually pursuing goals and becoming a, an individual who has loves and dreams and fears, and you, you've organized yourself towards some end, right? You're aiming towards something. Now, people believed that life should be like that as well, that in a sense, humans were, and uh, each animal was, in a sense, its teleologically perfected form in the first place. So every single animal, including humans, were sort of the best they could be, right? And the idea was that uh, your job in life was to sort of live that out. And so the idea that things would change over time was anathema to that concept, right? 
And I feel there's the same sort of resistance to evolution of planets and evolution uh, of, of bodies in the sky. It's the same idea that, well, the Earth is kind of perfect, and uh, that's it. let's keep it that way, right? And, and uh, this bleeds over into a lot of the climate narratives that we see today. It's this resistance to change, um, which I think is... Uh, you know, at best is a little naive, but, but at worst it's sort of, uh, it's sort of irrational and, and perhaps leads us into solution sets that aren't actually actionable. And that's what's, what's really uh, perplexing about it and per per potentially threatening as well. I mean, you know, we might be able, it's, there's no doubt that humans, of course, we've talked about climate before, of course humans are having an impact on our environment in many, many ways, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely, uh, we've absolutely remodeled the face of the earth. There's no doubt about that. Um, and we've, in some senses, changed things uh, arguably for the worse. I mean, species diversity has gone down. Um, but in terms of the bigger superstructures, the patterns of the earth, right, the, the climate itself, it's like, do you think you're going to be able to stop that periodic every you know, 100,000 years, we get glaciers and we get interglaciers, right? The Earth's been doing this for millions of years. Um, the idea that we're going to get in front of that and stop that from happening is, is perhaps, uh, perhaps not the right way to think about it. Perhaps the right way to think about it is what are we going to do to, to, to sort of fortify ourselves in the face of this change that happens, which I think is a lot more healthy way to look at it. So anyways... <clears throat> Uh, let's think about that as we talk about gas giants and we talk about where they fit into this landscape and really all of these planets. I think that we have to leave a little bit of room in our minds for, for these, these bodies being on an evolutionary continuum. Maybe they are, are in some sense uh, steps on that, that uh, planetary tree of life, much like we would look at organisms, right? We might think of, say, uh, uh, something like... Uh, I don't know. We might think of primates as being, uh, in some sense, uh, on the tree that led to humans, right? And you might similarly start thinking about some of these bodies as being on a tree that leads to a more complex version of them. And of course, I would argue that we're sitting on one of the most complex versions of a planet possible, in some sense. So that might have been a really long road to get to there. Um, and a lot of these, you know, I think that one of the biggest impediments to pursuing some of these evolutionary ideas is because the time scales required are thought to be far longer than we have available to us given the current cosmology, which gives us an age of the universe on the order of a few billion years, right? Now, that, that, that narrative is in some sense under deep threat at the moment, let's say. Uh, every time we build a telescope that can see further distances, the more we see that contradicts the idea that we're seeing the beginning of the universe. And so I would not be surprised at all. In fact, I'm quite certain that those timescales will expand as we can see further. They're already sort of being tried on the idea that, well, maybe the universe is, is older than we thought it was. Well, how long will that go on for, right? So as the timescales expand, so the timescales for the development of these planets expand, and so the possibility for considering their evolution in a larger scheme can also persist. And... And that's what's really exciting about the future of planetary science, as far as I can tell. And that's why I'm spending so much time on talking to you about these gas giants, because they're so similar to stars, actually. And in fact, I made the case to you last time that at some point, the real boundary between star and planet, like a brown dwarf, comes down to a single atom. You take that atom away, it doesn't have the energy, it doesn't have the mass to fuse anymore. You add that atom, and it does. It's a really, really fine boundary. And it's very, very easily conceivable, at least from a rationalist point of view, that that transition could, could be dynamic, and that you could go both ways at any given moment. You could have stars that turn into planets, planets that turn into stars. So it's a crumbling fine line there. And, and uh, again, this is, this is not a popular idea right now, but it is something to, to think about, and I think it's exciting. Anybody have questions about that? All right. <clears throat> it's not going away. We'll keep talking about it. So last time we, we compared um, 
brown dwarfs and Jupiters and red dwarfs, which are, of course, the, the smallest stars that are able to actually fuse proper hydrogen, the light kind of hydrogen. And, you know, I'm going to keep impressing upon you this continuum, but one thing you see is that there's this very convective uh, motion of the material inside of stars. And that persists into brown dwarfs. And one of the first things we see in these cooler planets, these Jupiters, is that that convective uh, process sort, sort of dissipates, and you get this layered architecture, um, much, in some, much, much like our own Earth, actually, the atmosphere that we looked at. It has you know, certain patterns of weather at different heights, right? You don't see that so much in the stars and in the brown dwarfs. Um, all right. So here's a few of them. We can compare them. Um, and you can see, well, it's not so, so easy to see on these, uh, the different layered structures. We'll get into that more. But as you get into the Jupiters, you start to really see some of these different weather patterns appearing, right? On Jupiter, you know there's this huge storm that's been there. It's actually dissipating finally, but it's been there for hundreds of years as far as people have been able to look into telescopes. Saturn also has periodic storms. I'll show you a picture of a really cool one later. Um, but this seems to be a feature of the mixing and cooling of these bodies, right? And again, um, it's at least conceivable, if we allow ourselves the time scales, to imagine that if, if these bodies are able to persist long enough, that they could dissipate and cool and, and actually trend in the direction of something like Saturn from something like Jupiter, from something like a brown dwarf, from something like a star, which is really, really fascinating. Um, now, in terms of uh, where these brown dwarfs come from, I mean, how, why it is that they're not able to, say, turn into stars in the first place, one thing that's kind of interesting, we'll talk more about it next semester, is that almost all stars form in, in pairs, or, or, at le or sometimes clusters, three, four different stars, and they'll all sort of rotate together at some point. And so one thought is that these brown dwarfs start off in a pair, just like uh, all other stars forming, right? That there's two of them, let's say two kind of brown dwarfy looking things, and one of them sort of sops up all of the material in, in the nebula from which they're forming. The other guy is left over. And in some sense, maybe that one becomes a Jupiter. Or maybe, it's, maybe it sops up a little bit more than a Jupiter. And now that it has all that momentum, it ends up getting flung out of that star system. And it, it wanders by itself. And we would think of it as a free-floating planet, a rogue planet, or some sort of free-floating brown dwarf. So this idea of, of solar system instability in the early days <clears throat> By the time you get to a solar system like ours, it's very, very stable because all of these different resonances have been set up. So, so you know, Jupiter stabilizes a lot of the orbits in our own planetary system. It also does a great job of collecting all the nasty stuff that would ruin everybody's lives, right? We'll see when we look at, uh, at Jupiter, it's got these huge clouds of asteroids that sit in those nice Lagrange points that we talked about a few lectures ago, these nice little gravitational sinks and it drags them around and it collects them um, to the extent that, that most of the other planets, like Saturn doesn't even have any asteroids like this in its Lagrange points because it's thought that Jupiter grabbed them all. Um, Ju Jupiter's quite a, a great deal larger. So there's a stabilization that happens as these things uh, age, these solar systems age. And perhaps brown dwarfs escaped their solar system before this kind of stability was, was enacted. <clears throat> So we only actually have one proto-brown dwarf that we have in our sights in the telescopes right now. Um, this is an illustration, not an actual picture of it. <clears throat> but the cool thing is that, that that brown dwarf that's all by itself, it has a little disk around it, just like a tiny little solar system, which is interesting. It again puts it on that same continuum of almost a solar system, right? <clears throat> and if you look at um, some of our uh, gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter, you know, one of the first things that was really revolutionary when, when uh, Galileo started examining Jupiter was he, tr he said it's a mini solar system. It has all of these little bodies orbiting it. And actually, it has an even wider disk that's uh, less obvious, but it's thought that Jupiter in the past had a very similar disk to Saturn, and that Saturn's disk will evolve into something more like moons, the moons of Jupiter. <clears throat> 
Um, Saturn has quite a number of moons, and, and there's reason to believe Saturn's uh, in some sense, well, I can't say that definitively, but Saturn appears a bit younger. Its, uh, it's moons, uh, they orbit in all sorts of bizarre ways. A lot of them go the wrong direction. A lot of them are orbiting not in the ecliptic, so they're orbiting at strange angles with respect to its equator. And so as that stabilizes over time, you could imagine something uh, more in the, in the steady form. And so these things do seem to start off looking a lot like solar systems, but they just aren't able to be stabilized. In other words, the environmental conditions, the starting ingredients just aren't sufficient, right? It's a very selective process, much like this evolutionary idea that I, I was kicking around at the beginning. So that's really interesting. Um, what else do I want to say about these things? Uh, the, the, the Jupiters also seem to exist on a continuum, right? There's super Jupiters that are much bigger than Jupiter, all the way up to the edge of being brown dwarfs, but they're not quite brown dwarfs. And we see some of these super Jupiters orbiting one another. Uh, this is one of the newest findings that's coming in. I mean, these, these data points are arriving so, like I said, there's, these are such new ideas. They haven't made it into the textbook yet. You know, this study is showing these uh, dozens of, of orbiting Jupiters with no star associated. This came out like a, a month ago or something, right? So these things haven't really been incorporated into the story that, that, that most of these textbooks are trying to tell about the solar system. Remember, the, stellar, or, yeah, the solar system story that we have is 300 years old, more or less. We tried on a bunch of different alternatives and they didn't work out, but we didn't have any information about other solar systems at the time that these were being uh, constructed and, and that we were developing these standard dogmas in planetary science. So, this stuff is just absolutely cutting edge, brand new. It's so new that it hasn't even made its way into the narratives yet. And um, I think that's really, really fascinating. All right, so we also, uh, we also have these uh, planetary mass brown dwarfs, which are right on the edge of being Jupiters, essentially. And it, it's an like arbitrary delineation at some point, right? It's like, where do you make the cutoff? And they keep changing the cutoff point for all of these, like, below... 13 masses of Jupiter, you know, you have, uh, you have a Jupiter, but above that you have a brown dwarf. It's, it's rather arbitrary at some point. They keep tinkering with those numbers as to where, where to call that line. But they, they seem to exist on this continuum. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that, uh, so some of these brown dwarfs seem to be tending more towards something like a Neptune or a Uranus, something with these, these bigger uh, compounds, right? Something with, with larger ices available to it. Um, they're cooler, for instance, for starters, but they also have the ability to have water and, and methane and, and more complex molecules. And of course, these are natural products of cooling, for one, they're condensation reactions in some sense, but it seems like, uh, it seems like the reactions that proceed and, and how methane reacts with the new hydroxyl groups that are appearing, the temperature of that star really dictates whether it's going to become something that looks more like Saturn or whether it becomes something that looks more like Neptune. So if we can imagine these brown dwarf-like looking things evolving, right? If they're cooler, maybe they're going to turn into something more like Neptune. If they're warmer, maybe they turn into something more like Saturn, right? The chemistry that results, the colors that you see, all of those seem to come down to how the temperature influences the reactivity of the basic building blocks that are available in both of them to some extent. And so we end up having this bifurcation point where you, uh, you do see brown dwarfs that in some sense do look a little bit more like Neptune and they have water and they have methane and they have uh, carbon monoxide. Um, and again, you're just drawing at some point an arbitrary delineation based on their mass of whether or not they're considered a planet or a brown dwarf, which is kind of the, the missing link, right? It's sort of the, the chimpanzee of the, of, the, of the tree of life here. All right. Yeah. By their mass, yeah. So, yeah, size is a weird, a weird thing to think about um, because the thing about brown dwarfs is they can be on the order of the radius of a Jupiter. They can have the same size, 
but they have a lot more stuff packed into that size. And that that's compression is what leads to heat, but it also leads to fusion in some sense. And they're able to fuse, he, fuse heavier elements like deuterium, which is just a heavy kind of hydrogen. It's more suitable to fusion. Um, it's easier to fuse it, is one way to think about it. Um, once they have enough stuff in that small place to be able to squish regular hydrogen together, now we call them a star. Although they might not look that different once they're a star. That's what's crazy. They might still be very, very dim and relatively cold compared to something like our sun. And they might be quite little too. I mean, something like 90% of the stars in our galaxy are smaller than our sun, right? Some of them are very, you can't even see them, they're so dim. They're basically, they're almost brown dwarfs, right? They're, they're just, uh, they are able to fuse a little bit of that hydrogen. Now, just because you're able to fuse a little bit of hydrogen doesn't mean you're gonna be glowing like a ball of fire in the sky, right? It's just gonna be, you're, gonna, you're not even gonna look different than a brown dwarf at that point, right? It's very, very, very fine line between these different bodies. And that, that sort of gets lost when we start binning them into, uh, you know, and the same thing could be said of species here on Earth. That word species is a, is a really, really funny word, actually. Um, you know, you look at the different species uh, of some animals, like Darwin was looking at these uh, finches, I believe, as he was traveling around the world. By the way, Darwin was not a scientist. He was not trained as a scientist. He had no background in formal science or anything like that. He, uh, he was a little bit of a, a lost boy when he was in his, his uh, formative years in his 20s. He, he was kind of, you know, inherited a good deal of wealth. He didn't really have to do much if he didn't want to. And uh, I believe some of his family members, I forget which one, were, were like, hey, why don't you do something? Uh, our friend is going on this uh, voyage. They need a naturalist to come along and document what's up. Uh, as they travel around the world. You know, this was in the very, very early days of exploration, to, you know, in terms of biological exploration. So they were trying to catalog the different animals. And he was like, all right, I'll do it. So he went on this ship and uh, he just started noticing uh, patterns, right? He started noticing how the species, well, what became known as species, that certain animals had resemblances to one another. And that the differences in those animals seemed to uh, confer some advantage to them in their particular habitat. And this is what he used to basically develop the theory of natural selection. And so, um, noticing the tiny little differences, noticing how they appear, noticing how, how the, the organisms are similar and different leads to the idea of species. But this, the idea of species is actually a really, really broken concept in some sense. Like for instance, there's all these species of fish. I, I noticed this maybe for the first time when I was talking to this marine biologist at Santa Cruz uh, named Milton Love, who I became friends with over the years. And Milton studies these rockfish. And at some point we were just talking about the rockfish and he, he talked about how these different species would sometimes breed with one another. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. I thought the definition of a species was that they couldn't breed with one another and produce fertile offspring. And he was like, well, not really with these fish. That's not how we think about it. And I started looking into it more and more. And it is the case that oftentimes species will breed with one another and create a new species, right? Now this is very troubling. If you look into the history of humans, right, you'll hear about the different species of early hominids, right, like Homo erectus, and like Homo neanderthalus and so forth, but you'll find that these species are actually breeding with one another. So are they really even species at that point? And if they're not, what is a species precisely? Is it just like, this is what's really crazy. So, you know, does anybody have a chihuahua? You've probably seen one, nice, you have one. Does anybody have a mastiff, right? Those are the same species, right? They look nothing like one another, but they're capable of producing fertile offspring. So they're all technically part of the species, but they, they have nothing in common with, with one another. Um, and in some sense, it's like this word species starts to fall apart. It's, it's a useful handle, but it, it's, not totally, it's not totally robust in a scientific sense. And, and I think that that's kind of what I'm trying to get at here with these different, you can see there's an arbitrary delineation that's set here. Um, could you have a, a, one of these larger uh, planets, let's say, could a brown dwarf for some reason smash into a, something and break into two, and now all of a sudden you have two Jupiters as a result of it, right? I mean, I'm not saying anyone's ever seen that happen, but it seems conceivable at least, right? That uh, in some sense these boundaries are very, very arbitrary, and they're, they're useful in terms of making, you know, 
constructing our theories, but they can also hobble us if we get too married to them because they can prevent us from seeing what's actually happening. So, I don't know. We can't, we can't talk enough about this. It's just going to keep, keep cropping up. Now, another really interesting thing is that it seems like there's a tremendous amount of these brown dwarfs. So, you know, according to Wikipedia, there's between uh, 25 and 100 billion brown dwarfs just free-floating in the Milky Way galaxy. So there's a lot of planets that just don't have a home out there. Uh, that's a lot, you know. And so how does that fit in? Where are these things coming from? Are they leftovers from star systems that formed? Did they get kicked out of solar systems? How stable are these solar systems ultimately? What would it take? Um, I think I mentioned uh, this gentleman that I was talking with, Sh uh, Sean Raymond, who was looking at what happens when a star comes too close to another star system. Really not even that close. He was, I think, moving them within 30 AUs, which is like, I think, uh, out on the Jupiter end of things, right? No, no that must, uh, that, that's even further. So barely inside of the solar system, let's say. If a star comes right at the edge of a solar system, what happens? Well, it throws a lot of planets out is what happens. It, it disturbs all the orbits. And so there's probably churn going on, honestly, especially because sometimes our star is in a really dense part of the Milky Way, and sometimes it's in a really sparse part of the Milky Way. You've seen these arms of the Milky Way, probably. We'll talk about these next semester more, but there's, there's really dense regions. And you might think, well, our sun is plopped down in the Orion arm. It's in a dense region. It probably just stays there as the galaxy turns, but it's not the case. The solar system actually travels between arms. It, it rotates in some sense faster or slower than the arms per, process. And so it makes its way through the different arms. So sometimes you're encountering more stars in your vicinity than others. And that's bound to have an effect. Um, but it's just, this is too third order for, to make its way into our, our traditional narratives of the solar system's history. Plus, it's like, what can you definitely say about our solar system, right? Science likes to make these definitive statements and you can't definitely say a lot of things about the deep past, particularly things billions of years ago. It's like, no one really knows. We only know it's possible things happened. For instance, where's our partner star? That's really, really strange. We're one of the only solar systems we know of that has no partner. We don't have a binary system here. That's very, very, very strange. And, you know, it almost certainly means that we did at some points, whether that was in the very, very early days of the solar system's formation or whether it was quite a bit later, it certainly changed things. I'm sure it shook things up quite a bit. Um, so there's a lot of history that we just can't possibly access. All right, so now we make it to R2 gas giants. They're liquid giants, of course. Um, these are the two beautiful planets that we have. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to jump behind a telescope, uh, well, not this year, but you can see Saturn's rings, you can see the moons of Jupiter. They're, they're two of the easiest things to fix your eyes on. They're the biggest bodies in our solar system. Saturn is actually turned at this very moment uh, so that its rings, right, it's, it's also at an inclination just like our planet. And so sometimes as it makes its orbit, uh, you can see those rings head on almost. And sometimes when they turn around like this, they're sideways and you can't see anything. And so right now we've entered into a period where uh, where we can't see Saturn's rings, which is unfortunate because they're very, it's very magnificent to see it through with your own eyes. There's something about getting behind a telescope and actually seeing these things that makes them extremely real to you. Like you can see these beautiful pictures of them from NASA and so forth, but when you see it with your own eyes, it, it just becomes, it, it has some sort of effect on you where you kind of realize like they're in your neighborhood, like they're there. It's very, very, very singular and unique. Um, and we have some telescopes here. Uh, the department owns some telescopes, so I, I've, I've been thinking about how we could maybe incorporate something like some observation into this. But of course, it would require us to all stay up really late at night. And that, I know you guys like staying up late at night, or get up really, really early, and uh, that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. <laughs> so I don't know, but it would be fun. All right, so what can we say about these things? Um, they. Uh, they, they have this outer layer we looked at. It's this compressed gaseous molecular hydrogen. When we say molecular hydrogen, we mean that it's hydrogen bounded to another hydrogen, right? It's this diatomic hydrogen, the gaseous form of hydrogen. But just below that layer is a more compressed form of hydrogen that's, that acts more like a liquid, right? And as you go deeper, that liquid compression leads it to act more and more like a metal. And of course, metals and ions and so forth are very, very strange because at some point when you compress atoms together tight enough, 
they, they become metallic, right? Which is strange. That really just means that their, sh their outer surfaces, their electrons, become delocalized. Everybody's sort of sharing the same surfaces at some point. Their, their electrons become, they can see the electrons are delocalized. I think a more rational way of thinking about that is that they're, they're basically all in contact to the point that you can't discern one surface from the next, right? Be like, uh, you know, if we all packed uh, like 100 people into an elevator, we'd be just a bunch of mush at some point, right? So that's kind of what happens with these planets down, down below. <clears throat> um, the cores are a little bit nebulous. Uh, it's, it's difficult for us to do the same sort of sonar studies on these as with others. We can infer some information about the cores from their density. Uh, in other words, we know the gravity, so we know the mass, and we know their radius, so we can make some estimates of density, which is just mass per volume. <clears throat> Based on that, we have some sense that there is a solid core that contains really heavy elements in a lot of these, um, and that they're different between, say, the ice giants that we'll, we'll visit later and these giants, which seem to have really heavy cores, right, that are very metallic, um, the big, big atoms, whereas the ice giants seem to have cores that are a bit more rocky and silicate, sort of like our own planet. In fact, that's a really interesting evolutionary feature that we're going we're gonna to swing back upon, is that the cores of the ice giants look a lot like our planet. That's really, really fascinating. Because again, you can start to put your imagination to work on, well, if you had enough time and you put one of those icy things next to the sun, what would happen to it? Well, it might end up looking a lot like this place. And that's really, really fascinating. Of course, that would take, uh, of course, that would take some, some interesting acts of chance, right? <clears throat> where, where the thing is able to migrate in its position and so forth. Things that are not uniformitarian, things that require catastrophic shifts in orbits that, that are very difficult for a, a unified scientific pr perspective on the history of the solar system to imagine because they involve these almost chaotic jumps in, in positions and so forth. And we, we don't like to think about things that way. Um, because, of course, we're trying to be very conservative and say things only which we can defend, which we've, we've observed, right? That's the hallmark of the empirical world we live in today. But we could be missing something, I think. Um, actually, this term gas giant, by the way, was invented by a science fiction writer in the 50s, which is, which is really funny. Uh, this guy, James Blish. And uh, he turned out to be wrong about that. Uh, but the name has stuck around and we're, we're left with it. Okay, so <clears throat> gas giants in general exist on this continuum, and it's, it's essentially based on temperature. So what we have here is uh, we have these giants ranging from very cold to very hot. So the very cold ones, type 1, are, uh, are considered to be, uh, they call them ammonia cloud giants, right? So they're able to have these sort of complex, ammonia is a pretty complex molecule. It's a carbon with four hydrogens stuck onto it. Um, and by the way, how do you even get molecules in the first place? Well, they're condensation reactions, right? How, does, how do you get, uh, <clears throat> if you do any basic chemistry, you know, you can take uh, something, something that's very rarefied, like basic elements, and if you suck all the heat out of them, they start to kind of group together, and you actually get molecules that are more complex that come out of it. And that's sort of what we're seeing. So the next, you, you have a little bit more heat and, and you can get water clouds, right? And uh, that's the type twos. The cloudless ones are type three. Then you start getting these alkali metal clouds at some point uh, in the more hot ranges, right? And of course, metals are in some sense uh, single atoms, right? So they're, they're much uh, less complex uh, chemistry. And then silicate clouds form in the type fives that are very, very hot. Um, these things actually, they have temperatures going up uh, into the, you know, 1400 Kelvin. This is like approaching uh, the, the temperature of our own surface of our own sun, which is like, I think, 30, uh, sorry, 3,500 Kelvin, something like that. So they get very, very hot, uh, these giants. And of course, at some point, they're going to transition into being um, brown dwarfs, which are going to potentially get even hotter and cover that middle ground. Now, Jupiter and Saturn are pretty hot, um, but they are, well, they have heat, let's say, but they're pretty, excuse me, they're pretty cool compared to some of these upper classes. They're considered in the first uh, type, type one. There are hot Jupiters, which is quite interesting. There are some gas giants we've seen. These are really, really interesting uh, pieces in our evolutionary story, too. 
So one of the first, remember, when people started looking for exoplanets, they were looking at ones that they could see pass in front of a star. Now, the ones that are passing in front of the star that we see the most are, are generally the biggest ones, and they're the ones that are close to the star, right? So they're going to leave nice shadows. We can see them. What they found in some of these, uh, these early uh, planets was that it, very strangely, uh, they were Jupiters that were much hotter than ours because they were much closer to the sun, it was thought, but they were getting their atmospheres stripped away from them very rapidly. So they were shrinking appreciably. This was, this was in the last 20 years that this was realized. And so, again, these planets seem to be evolving. What happens to a gas giant like a Jupiter when you strip away all of its atmosphere? It's a really good question. And, uh, you know, you, you have to really just use your imagination. What, what do we have in our own solar system that would look something like a Jupiter that had lost all of its atmosphere? I mean, you know, when we talk about uh, these carbon, like the, the alkali metal uh, type 4s, they have uh, a dominance of carbon monoxide in their atmosphere. Um, you know, you can imagine something that, like, what happens if you put a, a bunch more atmosphere on top of something like Venus, for instance? Well, it might start to look a little bit like one of those uh, gas giants at some point. So maybe, uh, maybe a Venus is something on that same transition point. Pure speculation. Um, I'm not saying it is so, but it certainly seems possible, which is, which is really interesting. All right, I don't think I'm going to say too much more about hot Jupiters, except that we've seen a lot of them. So it do, it's, it's almost like we've seen so many of these hot Jupiters that it seems like a little bit uh, ignorant to not include that uh, as a possibility in the formation of our own planets, right? I mean, there's, they're in some sense, some of the most prominent, uh, like prominent phenomena that we observe. They're some of the most prominent planets that we've seen. That might be a sampling bias, right? Because again, they're close to the sun, they're big. And so maybe we just see a lot of them because they're the easiest ones to see. That's undoubtedly figuring in. But it also might be that it's, we see a lot of them because it happens all the time, right? And it might be that in the deep history of our own solar system, it happens several times as well, right? So what does that leave us with? I mean, can that help us explain some of these strange, uh, strange planets that we see in our solar system that we don't necessarily see in young planets? Uh, young planetary systems, because um, we certainly don't see many of the planet types that we have in our solar system in these new uh, exoplanetary systems, especially the, the young ones. In fact, the young ones are mostly uh, heterogeneous. They're, they're all sort of the same kind of planets, which is very interesting. And they all seem to be very, uh, for the most part, the most common kind of planet is this super Earth kind of planet, which is like something between an Earth and a Neptune, right? much bigger, much more uh, atmosphere, much more water, much more, much like the story that we tell about the early Earth, as a matter of fact. Because if you, if you go to the geologists and ask them about the early Earth, they'll tell you it was originally, um, in some sense, well, it was this molten body, but it had a great deal of water on it. Um, the story of the water has changed in my lifetime considerably. It used to be that the prevailing theory was that we got hit with a bunch of comets. Um, which really bothered me as a child, honestly, because I was just like, what are you talking about? There's no way there's enough comets to, to put these oceans here. The first time you visit the ocean, you're just like, this is, this is a ridiculous idea. And people aren't really thinking that's the case anymore. They think the water came from chemical reactions, much like these condensation reactions we're talking about in, in some of these uh, Jupiters, right? That, and that there's a lot of water bound up in our crustal materials, too. There's something, there's estimates now that there's something like at least one ocean's worth of water. Maybe some estimates go as high as five or six times the ocean's worth of water in, bound up in the rocks below our feet. Okay? So, so the early Earth looks, looks a lot like, uh, in some sense, looks a lot like these super-Earths, which is really, really fascinating. And why don't we have any super-Earths left in our solar system? Everybody else has them. What's up with that? Well, is it because we've, we're a, on a later point in the evolution of our solar system? Or is it just because we're the complete anomaly, right? I don't know. But uh, I, I think the evolutionary standpoint uh, is really, really intriguing and something, something to, uh, that could fill in a lot of gaps. Um, again, it, it comes down to being able to entertain the idea that things happen very suddenly sometimes, orbits change very suddenly, and maybe that happens more often than we'd like to admit. And it also might involve longer timescales than we're willing to entertain, which are constrained by our cosmology at the moment. 
So we're still stuck with this idea that our planet's essentially formed right where they're at. Maybe they journeyed in and journeyed out a little bit, but they're, they're pretty much where they started. And uh, that's the story that we're stuck with in the textbook for now. Um, but I think that it's fraught with contradictions, especially with respect to all the other solar systems that we can now see forming and that we can now inventory. Um, they seem to be at a different point on the evolutionary time scale compared to our own. And I, I think that there's some, some you know, really intriguing speculation. I mean, you know, it makes more sense, <laughs> Dusty says. It does make more sense. I mean, that's the funny thing about a, that's the funny thing about science, right, is that, uh, you know, what is, what is a theory other than it starts off as something like pure speculation, and then at some points, you know, people will say, well, it's evidence-based. And it's like, well, what evidence are you talking about? Which evidence are you talking about? Because maybe I'm talking about this other evidence, and you don't want to talk about that evidence. And so it's a very, you know, science is not this clear-cut thing where, like, uh, you know, you just have some evidence on the table and everybody is like, okay, well, that's how it is. It's like not like that at all. It's like you go, has anybody ever had the privilege of being in a court trial before? Yeah? Nice, me too. Um, it's, it's not so simple as you submit the evidence and then go home, right? You gotta, you gotta tell a compelling story of what the evidence says about what happened, right? And that's what decides whether you win or lose the case. It's not the evidence that decides what people decide happened. It's the story you tell. It's whether that story is convincing to explain the evidence that eventually prevails. And so the evidence isn't necessarily, maybe we have more evidence later as we get better instruments and so forth, but the story has to be told in such a compelling way by somebody with the authority to tell that story that it becomes undeniable at some point. And that's what happened with the theory of evolution. I mean, Darwin had no authority whatsoever, which is actually amazing that he was able to get his ideas across because he was a nobody. But he was able to tell a story that really summed up the features of the world in a way that made more sense than the people that, were, that had the authority to be telling the story before him. And so that's a real coup. It's really, it's really kind of incredible that he pulled that off, actually. Um, I can't think of too many cases where somebody comes along from outside of science and sums up the scientific evidence better than the scientists could do themselves. But Darwin was able to do it. Um, you know, the story I'm, I'm trying to hint at here about the evolution of planets and stars and stuff, I have no authority to tell that. I'm not a research astronomer or anything like that. Um, so, I, you know, no one's going to listen to me. It's, a, it's just an interesting idea, right? And so maybe someone with more authority will come along and tell that story in the future, and then all of a sudden it's just the story. It's in the textbooks all of a sudden. That's how it works in science. So I don't know. I think we can really think about science much like the court case. It's very much like you're prosecuting a theory. Everybody who's out there in science and working on some idea, they're really trying to say how their narrative explains the evidence better than somebody else's narrative. And, um, and that's, kind of, that's kind of how things go. And all of a sudden, once people are convinced of it, then the judge rules, right? And it ends up in the textbook, and that's how it goes. But at the end of the day, they're just stories that we're telling, right? And some of them are better than others, and some of them stand the, stand the test of time for a long time. Sometimes our theory is like the story that we've been telling about our solar system has persisted for hundreds of years. But almost all of our theories will be overturned. I, I would go so far as to say all theories are eventually overturned. Um, there's always a... This, nature is, in some sense irreducibly complex, right? The closer you look at something, you know, you can t test this out with a, with a, if you ever have the privilege to look under a microscope, take something that looks like a simple, simple material, right? Anything you can find, like a, I don't know, a, uh, like this table, it seems pretty featureless and so forth, but put it under a microscope and you open up an entirely new world of chaos and order. And, and this is just the case with science. The more we learn, the more we have to reformulate our stories about what's actually going on. It's just inevitable. So, you know, and all of this is, of course, really, really, really stressed by the fact that people are building careers on top of this stuff, right? You make a theory, you, you're not really interested in seeing that theory dethroned, right? You've built a whole reputation. I mean, my God, we give people Nobel Prizes where some, they kneel before some king and get this medal. I mean, it's like, this almost religious ceremony by which we sort of say, okay, this is a good idea. But it's like, what have we done by doing that? Because 
now we're stuck with this good idea for all of time in some sense. I'm not aware that any Nobel Prize has ever been revoked, right, or that anyone has ever been overturned, but I think that's going to become a real big problem soon, actually, um, especially with Nobel Prizes having been given in such esoteric disciplines as cosmology, right, which is literally talking about the birth of the universe, which has traditionally been the purview of religion. Mm. And then as I, you know, as I come back into science, it's just completely different here, which is neat. Which it is neat, but it's, it's difficult to change some of those big ones, I guess is what I'm saying. That's what's really hard, is that at some point when you start giving these, uh, when you start having these knighted ceremonies where you, you, you deem people having, you have come up with the best idea. It's like, how do you move that needle at that point? Darwin had to be rich if you get whacked from the church at that point. Yeah. Darwin, Darwin was rich. He was very afraid. By the way, Darwin, uh, the reason he didn't publish that book earlier is because he was very afraid. Um, he, he waited until he was basically dead to publish that book. He waited until Wallace was about to publish his own, is the truth. But I think he would have published it after his death had he not uh, been threatened of getting scooped by Wallace. So you're right. People are afraid. People with radical ideas are afraid um, because there's such a wild force that prevents uh, this change, right? especially if they have a really good idea. Copernicus, we talked about with the geocentric revolution, or the heliocentric revolution, he waited until he was basically dead to publish that, that was those ideas. He, carried, he famously carried his theory of the solar system around in his breast pocket, and he would, he would take it out and make notes on it when he would talk with very close friends about it. But he, he didn't publish his idea uh, until he was basically dead, right? And the printing press came around, and he was able to self-publish it at that point. So... I don't know. There's a lot of pressure to, to keep people censoring themselves, and there's, uh, there's a lot of pressure for people to stand on theories that don't make sense anymore just because there's so much social weight given to the people who come up with the ideas, right? I mean, Einstein is basically a god, right? It's like, um, yeah, it's like, at some point, we really almost deify these people that come up with revolutionary ideas. And that's, you know, I think it's good to be reverent for people. Certainly, Einstein was a brilliant man. But to make them something almost like unhuman as a result of it makes it very difficult to progress in science, which is really ultimately threatens the entire enterprise. And, and it worries me. Um, it worries me about that because nobody is perfect. And sci no scientific theory is perfect either. And we have to be able to change our mind about these things. And it's a fine line because you don't want to just throw things out willy-nilly either. You want to have some bedrock to stand on, right? You want to at least possess some working knowledge of how the world works. And so it is important that we're skeptical of new ideas, right? But we can't be skeptical to the point that we're not open-minded. So it's this fine, fine balance between chaos and order uh, of new ideas. And the same thing is true in, in society too, right? What happens when a society becomes too ordered and too rigid, right? Well, you end up with something that looks like fascism or totalitarianism, right? When the state is just dictating every aspect of your life, when you can leave your house, what you have to put in your body, things like this. It's too much order, right? It's too much. It's destructive to the society. People need that freedom to be able to make choices and actually make mistakes and be able to live out their, their own lives. And so, you know, there's this fine line, but at the same time, you can have complete anarchy if there's no rules whatsoever. Then you just have the meanest people on the block doing whatever they want. And so it's like, you're always dealing with this very, very fine balance between how much, you know, faith you're going to put in some structure versus how much open-mindedness you have towards it. So that, that's sort of the human project in some sense, is, is walking that tightrope. All right. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about these hot Jupiters, by the way, is that they, uh, they, a lot of them have retrograde orbits, so they're orbiting the wrong direction, which to me uh, indicates that they, they moved there from somewhere else. They were sort of chaotically, their, their orbits were perturbed in such a way that they were, they were chaotically flung into, into some new orbit, which is another pinpoint on this evolutionary timeline. Um, was it some capture events? How did they get there? Because the thing is, in order to accumulate a huge amount of, let's say, these volatile, in, in order to get really cold, right, to make something like a Neptune, which has all these ice-like compounds, these condensed molecules, right, these waters and these, 
methanes and so forth, you got to be really cold to do that, right? Those are at the cold end of, of the gas giant spectrum. But we find those things very close to suns sometimes, right? These Jupiters too, even to condense that, uh, that uh, molecular hydrogen, right? Even to get that gassy outer layer, it's got to be cold on the outside. So they can't have formed too close to a sun, and yet we find a lot of them close to the sun. And this, of course, uh, points to the really disturbing idea that these planets actually wander over time. Or they, maybe they wander very, maybe it's not wanders, maybe it's step-like jumps in their location. Maybe there's interactions with other star systems that bring them all of a sudden into a completely new configuration. So, um, has anybody ever seen these uh, Clodney plates before? Pretty cool. You guys should, should Google this or look at it on YouTube. But people will do these experiments where they'll, where they'll basically have like a, a plate that they'll hook up to a speaker. And they'll play different tones through the speaker. And they'll put sand on top, right? And what's very beautiful is that as they sweep the frequencies, right, different, different uh, rates of vibration, certain modes of that frequency, uh, certain frequencies, will result in these beautiful geometric patterns being produced on, on top of the plates, right? But then you sweep the frequency a little bit and it goes to complete and utter chaos. No pattern whatsoever and then boom, it snaps into a resonant shape. Now the solar system that we live in is in a resonant pattern much like that. It's in this perfect harmony where the pull, push and pull of these planets is just so that it stabilizes the orbits. And so you can imagine that there's these, uh, that, that some elements of chaos, whether it's a passing star, or a nearby supernova, or anything that we can't even comprehend, could disturb it and lead to utter chaos for a moment before it snaps into a new resonant configuration that's actually stable. And so that's a really uh, interesting proof of concept. It's really something to, you guys should all go YouTube that stuff. It's really crazy. It can, uh, I don't know, give you some food for thought about, about so many things in nature, but particularly the stability of solar systems, which I think in some sense are those resonant patterns that we see on the Clodney plates. All right, Jupiter. Jupiter is really something. So it's the fifth planet. I don't know if I said that already. It's the largest planet. I think that we've all established that. Um, the ancients knew that it was the largest planet. In fact, almost all of the ancient cultures named it after their top dog deity, right? So the Romans called it Jupiter because, uh, well, Jupiter was, was basically the, who they inherited as their sort of, you know, patriarchal arch deity, right? They inherited it from the Greeks. It was known as Zeus to the Greeks, right? Um, so Jupiter, um, the Babylonians, even before them, they associated it with Marduk. And, and I don't know if we've talked about Marduk much before, but we definitely will. Uh, maybe we'll talk about Marduk more next semester. But um, the Semitic form of that, which led to the Hebrew, uh, they called him El or Baal. Baal. Um, and of course, we talked about how, how these lead to the basic idea of God in the, in the, in the Judeo tradition, tradition, which comes from... El and Elohim and these things, right? So the top dog is God, right? This is how everybody viewed Jupiter. And um, it's really interesting how the, the ancients seemed to apprehend in some sense, they didn't have this material conception of these bodies, but they did in some sense put them in the right order, which is really quite interesting, right? They did, whether they knew it or not, they, they did ascribe the attributes which were appropriate to them. I mean, Jupiter is very bright, but it isn't the brightest star in the sky, star, right? It's not the brightest uh, apparition. Venus is much brighter, actually. But for some reason, they gave Jupiter the top status. Why is that? How did they know that? Um, I don't know, but they did for whatever reason, and um, that persists. The, uh, the Hindu astrologers also uh, realized this. Uh, they called it basically the supreme teacher, um, was, was the deity that it represented. Um, China had a little bit of a different take. China called uh, Jupiter the year star. Does anybody have any idea why they did that? Any Chinese uh, ancestry people? Anybody aware? Anybody know about the Chinese zodiac and so forth? You guys probably heard this like, it's the year of the whatever, year of the dog. I don't know what year it is. I should have looked this up. Yeah, rat, dog. Um, there's a bunch of different ones. Well, it's really interesting. So there's... Uh, you know, in the plane of the ecliptic, right, there are these constellations that correspond, and there's 12 of them, right? These are the different months of the year for the Chinese, these different uh, zodiac symbols, right? So the constellations represent, you know, the dog or the rat or whatever. Well, the interesting thing is that Jupiter has about a 12-year orbit, 
So each year, it's in a new sign, essentially. And so Jupiter was what the ancient Chinese astrologers used to mark which year or which, uh, which zodiac it was in, right, each year. So that gives them a different year of the zodiac each time. So that's really interesting. The Chinese seem to have used Jupiter in a way that nobody else did, um, which is just like a completely different way of looking at things, which I think is pretty fascinating. Yeah, because Jupiter has that 12 years. So each year, Jupiter is going to be in a different sign, right? And it's totally a valid way of looking at it. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so here's a cross-section of Jupiter to the best of our knowledge, um, which, again, isn't fantastic. But um, we basically have this layer of hydrogen and helium, and that's, uh, in effect, about a quarter of its mass, uh, a tenth of its volume. Um, its core might be more rocky stuff, kind of like our own Earth, uh, we're not sure, right? We haven't really been able to figure that out other than by density at estimates. Um, Jupiter actually generates more uh, radiation and heat than it gets from the sun, which is really fascinating. Saturn, too. Saturn gives up, I think, twice as much radiation as it receives from the sun. So it's brighter than, than it would actually be otherwise. Now, a lot of that radiation is in the infrared and, and radio bands, right? So it's not necessarily visible light. But still, they're, they're quite warm, right? Um, and, and the heating that is go undergoing, they're not necessarily cooling appreciably either. And that has to do, uh, well, they're stable to some extent. And that has to do with the fact that they get a lot of compressive heat, just like the pistons in, a, in an engine of a car. And um, we've, been, we've been exploring these things quite a bit. These, this is all of the, uh, the different, well, some of these are actually, the first one's Galileo. I don't know if that counts as an exploration of Jupiter, but I'll give it to him. These are all essentially the different, um, observations that we've made. Some of these are flybys with actual uh, satellites, like the Cassini-Huygens one, which was uh, in the last couple of decades. New Horizons was in 2007. Uh, let's see, the first flyby was Voyager 1. That was in 1979. And before that, oh no, the first flyby was Pioneer 10 in 73. No, was, yep. And then before that, it was, uh, it was basically Galileo with his tiny little telescope. And so we don't have a ton of information about this. We've been able to, to sort of loop around the thing and take some nice pictures and make some measurements, but that's about all that we've got. Um, the, the latest probe to visit the planet, Juno, I guess didn't make it into this uh, picture. This was in July of 2016. Uh, and then it seems like most of our future missions are going to be really, really geared at checking out its moons because Jupiter has some pretty tempting moons in terms of looking at potential habitable regions, right? There's uh, moons with subsurface oceans, and we'll talk about these. Um, I think we'll have a lecture dedicated just to moons, and we'll really look at the structure of these things because it's quite fascinating. I don't think they're going to be places we want to set up shop, though, necessarily. Um, they're very cold. I don't know if anybody wants to live below uh, several kilometers of ice. I think it's like something terrible, like 30 kilometers of ice. I don't think that's going to be a very fun place to hang out. But it could be... Uh, it could be promising in terms of uh, a stopping point on the way to somewhere else. So we'll talk more about that later. Now, Jupiter has a, a pretty serious magnetosphere, which is nice um, in terms of protecting it from solar wind. Um, in some sense, its, it's magnetosphere is generated in a very different way than the one that we have here on Earth. So, you know, there is some mysteries about how our, magnetic, uh, yeah, how our magnetosphere is generated here on Earth. Uh, but we have this basic idea of these molten fluids like towards the inner part of the mantle that are rotating and leading to this solenoid-like action that's able to, you know, conduct and basically set up something like a generator, right? On Jupiter, it's a little bit different. So uh, something kind of interesting happens. One of its moons, the innermost moon, it's actually a very volcanically active moon, and it's spewing all of these... Uh, uh, very electrified elements into the uh, ring right around Jupiter. And those sort of metallic and, and conductive elements are actually contributing as they interact with Jupiter's atmosphere in a frictional sort of way to produce an actual magnetic field and amplify the magnetic field that Jupiter has by itself. So they ha it has this self-sustaining reaction that involves the presence of its moon which is really, really different and interesting. I, I think we'll have a chance to tear that apart a little bit deeper when we look at Jupiter's moons in depth. Um, Jupiter has these beautiful auroras, too, sometimes, which have to do with its interaction with the solar wind, just like our own auroras do. Uh, 
Um, and it's thought that in some sense uh, that these, uh, that there is some sort of, that the persistence of its magnetic field has to do with, in some sense, um, it is amplified, like I said, by that uh, outflow from the moon, Io, but it has this swirling metallic hydrogen layer, much which we can think of as very analogous to our own inner core that's swirling around. There's some conductive medium, and so it has some overlap with our own magnetic field. It just seems to be amplified in a way that we don't have any congruence with here. So Jupiter has 80 known moons that are, you know, in appreciable size, and some of them, here, uh, this is, these four are considered the Galilean moons because, of course, they're the ones that are big enough for Galileo to see with his telescope. Um, some of them honestly rival the size of our Earth, right? I mean, Ganymede's enormous. It, it looks a lot like our moon, but it's huge. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a whole story to be told about all of these, and, and we'll, we have time to go through it later. But I want you to be aware that it has, it's basically a miniature little solar system. It has so many different bodies that are, are, are circling around the thing. Um, some of them, some of the moons, perhaps are latecomers to the party. Some of them rotate uh, prograde. That means the big ones, um, they're all rotating in the same direction as its rotation. But some of them are, are retrograde, right? These ones that are further out are going the wrong direction around the thing. That's very perplexing. I mean, what's the story with that? How, how did that happen? Are they late joiners? Perhaps. And then, this is what I was talking about with the, uh, the Lagrange point captures. Huge, huge clusters of, uh, of asteroids that are trailing and behind this, uh, uh, trailing and leading Jupiter in its path. And they're, they're really, really good for the rest of us in the interior because they tend to swoop up things that would otherwise threaten us. So, you know, there was that big, I talked to you guys about uh, the, the alarm over impacts, right, that was sort of triggered by the shoemaker levy impact that we saw on Jupiter. And it's not a coincidence. It seems that Jupiter, in some sense, serves as uh, uh, like a net. It grabs up all of the big comets that tend to come in and orbit around the sun and then get kicked back out. Oftentimes, Jupiter will just grab those things up and they'll crash into it, which probably saves us from a, a lot of you know, heartbreak here on Earth because a lot of the things that might threaten us get eaten by Jupiter first. So it's a great uh, hungry uh, monster, right? It, it eats a lot of the problems that we might deal with in, on the interior in here because we're protected by its wonderful gravitational presence. I mean, Jupiter's gravitational pre presence can't be overestimated. It's actually, uh, it can actually be said that, you know, Jupiter doesn't technically orbit the sun. It orbits a point that's actually something like 7% of the radius of the sun outside of the sun. So the sun and Jupiter actually orbit a common point that's not inside of the sun, right? So, you know, in some sense, Jupiter and the sun are, are more of a binary system uh, than otherwise. Of course, the sun's much more massive, but Jupiter's got almost all of the rest of the mass of the solar system. Everybody else accounts for a tiny fraction of it. And so Jupiter, it's a very, very important player in our own solar system, particularly in the story of the Earth, because it seems to have protected us um, from cataclysm. So they call these, uh, they call the, tr the ones that are trailing the Trojans, and they call the ones that are leading the Greeks, for whatever reason. Um, if you guys are aware uh, of the story of the Trojan horse and all of this, the Greeks and the Trojans were arch nemesis. And uh, it's just interesting how our, how our mythology persists. We can't get away from it. All right, let's see what I want to cover in these last five minutes here. Um, Saturn's really not that, that different in, in some sense from Jupiter in terms of its internal structure. Uh, it, Jupiter is a lot more dense than Saturn, so there's more opportunities for chemistry in the upper atmosphere of Saturn. Um, it's got this, like for instance, Saturn's a bit more pale yellow color. This is because of the ammonium crystals that are in the upper atmosphere, so it has a bit more complex chemistry, right? Um, it, it's, uh, it's cooler. It has a very hot interior, though, uh, and so it has this layered-like structure. There's, um, what else do I want to say about this? Uh, 
there's a lot of uh, there's weather systems that appear on Saturn, right? Where there's there's different layers of density of material that are rising and falling, and the result of all that friction is that you get the presence of again another magnetic field that's quite strong around Saturn. Um, you know, electricity in some sense can be thought of as a frictional process, right? When you uh, you might have experienced this if you just like pick up static electricity by rubbing your hands on something, or or uh, you know you take a balloon and rub your hair on it or something, right? You can get this static electricity buildup. So electricity is fundamentally a frictional process, and that happens on Saturn. Um, as, a, you know, as a result of this, um, it's suggested that there's rainfall of, of diamonds on, on Saturn as a result of the upwelling of these really crushed down carbon, uh, carbon entities, uh, moieties, that are then able to sink back down. So it's a very, very strange weather pattern. There's actually these strange storms that persist. We did this uh, flyby recently, and we saw this strange pattern of these polar vortexes on Saturn that nobody knew about before. And uh, very interestingly, some scientists tried to reproduce this in the lab. I think this is really cool. I'd like to see more of this, where people try to actually make, uh, you know, models of planets in laboratories. And they were able to actually, by simply rotating the fluid at the core of this, uh, this basin, they were able to actually generate these same swirling patterns, these stable uh, hexagonal vortices on the surface of Saturn uh, by sort of mimicking the densities and, and so forth that you would get on S Saturn itself. So that was a big mystery as to how that formed, but it really just comes down to the rotation of the inner core. The inner materials are layered, right? All the layers on Saturn. The inner ones are rotating faster than the outer ones, and it, it produces this hexagonal vortex structure, which is really quite stable. Again, Saturn's a bit of a mess. So it has, these are all of its moon systems as they're orbiting. Some of them are going completely out of whack with the plane of the ecliptic. Um, and so, I don't know, Saturn seems like a, a in some sense, younger uh, by, by this estimate. If you think about the stability of orbitals as being a measure of age, it's, it seems like a bit, a bit uh, earlier. And if we want to entertain the evolutionary idea, it seems like it's a bit less evolved. Uh, or perhaps, uh, perhaps it's been through, perhaps it's been kicked around a bunch and it's gained all of these things later, so it's more evolved in some sense because it has more complex chemistry. Maybe Saturn evolved in a cooler region, so it was able to develop more complex chem chemistry as a result of it. You know, there's all these things. Is, was it its nurture or was it its nature? Was it in the right circumstances to develop these, this particular phenotype, or did it evolve into being like that over time? It's hard to really separate out the, those features. Um, again, this is Saturn's plane. Right now, we're looking at it head on, so we're not, we're not gonna be able to see those rings. And then, I guess, I guess we'll, uh, we'll finish up here that, you know, this is one of those transient storms on Saturn. So st Saturn's storm, unlike Jupiter, all right, it's, uh, it's far less dense, so those weather patterns don't persist as long. That, that storm on Jupiter has been sort of stuck in place, but it's a much, much more dense atmosphere on Jupiter. This one on Saturn, I think, only lasted for a few weeks, but it does look in some sense quite similar to the one that we saw on Jupiter, which is eventually fading. So again, this is, uh, I'm going to stop here, but what I want to say is that this is Jupiter if you look at it in the infrared, right? It looks a lot like, you know, a warm, uh, in some sense it looks like a more organized version of a star. And this is just a matter of looking at its heat. If we heat the thing up, we get something that looks a lot like, more like a star. If we cool it off, we get something that looks a lot, a lot more like a planet. There's an interesting continuum to think about here. And so... I think what we'll open up with next time is I'm going to tell you the, the traditional story uh, of, of the formation of Jupiter, which we can compare and contrast with a, with a, a longer time-scaled evolutionary model. And then we'll get into the, the icy planets and the valley between the Earths and the icy planets and try to think about the missing links there. So, all right, guys. We'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.